as we get into this learning series, I wanted to start early. I know what you're thinking. Stephen, you skipped Thanksgiving. I did. I apologize. Uh, but I, I really wanted to jump into this um, because I believe that no matter who you are, in person, online, in fact, if you're watching online, on YouTube specifically, be sure to like this video and then subscribe to our channel so you never miss a message in this series specifically because I'm telling you, you're going to want this. We're going to keep this going through our Revive Christmas on December 18th. But this idea of making this Christmas the best Christmas really resonated with me because I don't know about you, I didn't appreciate Christmas until I became an adult. And the reason for that was not because I didn't understand the generosity behind Christmas. I love being generous all the time. Christmas is one of my favorite times to be generous, but it's because I became a parent. And if you're not a parent, by the way, this still uh, uh, relates to you, but when you get older and you start buying gifts for little kids, and then you try hauling their butts around to six different houses during the holidays, you have a new appreciation for what your parents did when you were a kid. I didn't know how much it sucked to grab all the kids, put them in the car, get all the presents, go from one house to the next house to the next house on Thanksgiving. But now I do. And the more that the older I get, the more I realize that if I don't set some boundaries in my life around Christmas time, around Thanksgiving, that everything becomes overwhelming. And whether you are single, whether you are married, whether you have kids or don't have kids, we all have things around this time of the year that will drain us if we allow it. Hello? We've all been there. So what I want to teach you is how to make this Christmas the best Christmas. Last week, we finished our learning series, Fight for Me. We talked about praying for this generation, prioritizing this generation, participating in their lives, being a generational investor. I want to encourage you to watch that on YouTube. But this learning series today is all about making this, this Christmas the best Christmas. How many of you want to make this Christmas the best Christmas? Can you say yes to that? I want to make it the best Christmas. Well, here's our theme verse to make this Christmas the best Christmas. It's found in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11. You're going to love this. It's all Christmas right here. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness for those who have been trained by it. It produces a harvest of righteousness and this word peace for those who have been trained by it. Welcome to Revive, where Christmas is all about getting discipline. Here's the secret to this learning series. If you want to make this Christmas the best Christmas, you need to stop focusing on December 25th, 2022, and you need to start focusing on December 25th, 2023. If you want this Christmas to be the best Christmas, you need to start focusing not on what this Christmas has to offer, but what next Christmas has to offer. In other words, what I'm telling you is this. We're going to get discipline. If you want this Christmas to be the best Christmas, you're going to have to implement some things in this Christmas that causes discipline in your life year round. Now, I'm going to start out with a subject that a lot of people may not like, but we're going to talk about money. Because Christmas, unfortunately, has become this thing that's all about consumerism. In fact, I have some interesting stats around Christmas spending. The average American spends $998 on Christmas, just under $1,000 on Christmas. One in three Americans will increase their debt by an average of $1,249 this Christmas. Remember, these are averages, so some are high, some are low. Around 40% of Americans will use the buy now, pay later feature financing online this Christmas. And here's the idea, here's the reality behind this. All these things that we do financially around Christmas, also we have to pay our bills we also have to buy the kids new shoes. We also have to pay for groceries. We have to pay our rent. We have to pay our mortgage. We have to, all the, we still have responsibilities, but we go deeper into debt. We go deeper into spending around Christmas time. Why? Because we think that spending money will make this Christmas the best Christmas. And while it's a temporary high on December 25th, January 1st sucks. <laughs> because then the first bill comes in. And we can't afford it. And so while we may have a good Christmas, we have an awful year the next year. So today what I want to talk to you about 
is this idea of how to make this Christmas the best Christmas. And we're going to touch first on our finances. And I want to give you a message that I've titled, The Best Comes From the First. Somebody say, the best, say, comes from the first. If you have your Bibles today, open them up to Exodus chapter 13. Exodus 13, just one place in the scripture today. If you scan the QR code on the screen or on your screen at, screen at home, uh, it'll take you to the YouVersion Bible app. We would love for you to add a Revive Church as your church in the YouVersion Bible app so we can know what people are reading. It doesn't show us your personal information or specifically who is reading what, but it shows me as a pastor what corporately our church is reading, what kind of plans we're reading, what books of the Bible we're in. And that helps me know where we are going as a church and better helps me pick some topics under the influence of the Holy Spirit that I can lead you in. So be sure to add Revive Church as your church. Exodus chapter 13. In the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, through every single book, there are principles that are carried throughout Scripture. There are principles that God has ordained in the Bible. And one of those, and the most important one, I believe, is something I want to share with you today. It's that the best comes when God is first. The best comes when God is first. When everything in my life comes under God first, when he is put first in my finances, in my marriage, in my relationships, in my singleness. Come on, single folks. We always teach you, the married couples, put God first in your marriage. What about the singleness? God can be first in your singleness and everything will be good. God comes first. When, when, when God is first, the best is really starts to show up. And in Exodus chapter 13, we see this. This is what's called the Old Testament. This is kind of not really the first half of the Bible, but this is the first part of the Bible, the Old Testament. Then we have the New Testament starting with Matthew. Um, and when you look at Exodus 13, we're going to see this principle that the best comes when God is first. Now, I want to clarify something because I'm not one of those preachers that wants to build you up on a high and not give you some reality. Here's a dose of reality. Even though God is first, it does not mean you won't come under attack. Even though God is first, it does not mean life will not kick you in the rear end. Even though God is first, it does not mean you will not have enemies. But here's what the word of God promises me. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. And my God shall supply every one of my needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. There are scriptures that say when I put God first, yes, some things will happen. You will get sick. Eventually you will die. But even then, when God is first, we are promised a resurrected life sometime in the future. There's this amazing principle that the best comes when God is put first. I want to look at Exodus 13, and this is an introduction to this principle. Starting in verse 1, here's a principle that says, The Lord said to Moses, Consecrate to me first every firstborn male. The first offspring of every womb among the Israelites belongs to me, whether human or or animal. So here's what God does. He institutes a principle here that the firstborn belongs to him. The firstborn male is his. It's owned by him. He takes ownership of it immediately. Let's skip down to verse 12. It says, you are to give over to the Lord the first offspring of every womb. Again, he says, this is mine. And all the firstborn males of your livestock belong to the Lord. Redeem with a lamb. I'm going to clarify this, so don't freak out. Redeem with a lamb every firstborn donkey. But if you do not redeem it, break its neck. Merry Christmas. <laughs> redeem every firstborn among your sons. Here's the first thing I want you to write down in your notes today. If you're not taking notes, you will not remember this. Take notes. The firstborn, according to the scripture, according to God must be sacrificed or redeemed. The firstborn must be sacrificed or redeemed. Pause. This is not an invitation to sacrifice your firstborn. Okay? <laughs> it's not what God's saying here. Let me tell you what's going on. Let me teach you a little bit about the Bible. The Bible is written to an ancient culture. The people of God were in an ancient culture culture. This is before modern church. This is before Jesus died on the cross, was raised from the dead. This is before Jesus said, I have come to not abolish the law, but fulfill the law. What a lot of us do is when we read through Genesis all the way through Malachi, we think that that doesn't pertain to us because we are Christians now in the New Testament church and we're under this grace thing. Grace was very present in the Old Testament. 
The laws of God were his grace for humanity because what he was doing is he was setting a precedent to say, put me first, do what I tell you to do and your life will be the best. That's grace because otherwise he could have just let us mess everything up and we wouldn't have survived more than probably 50 generations. But in the Old Testament, God gives us some principles that he called law. And we call this the Old Testament or the law of Moses in this uh, idea of Exodus and Deuteronomy and Leviticus. God told the people, this ancient culture, to do some things that sound strange to us. One of them is, if you have a donkey, a firstborn male donkey, you have to choose to either sacrifice a firstborn male lamb or you break the neck of the donkey. How many of you have done that in your lifetime? Anybody? Anybody? The cowboys in the house are like, actually, yes, sir. We did that just last week. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I'm so glad y'all are here. I love our church. We're such a culmination of different cultures. I love it. But here's the reality. What God was not saying is, I hate donkeys. No, no. What God says in the Old Testament is that there are clean animals and there are unclean animals. And there's this precedence that God sets is you don't eat or have uh, relations with unclean animals. Clean animal relationships, I'm not talking about sex. I'm talking about you don't keep these in the house as a pet. You don't eat these animals. You don't touch these animals. They are working animals. Donkeys were out in the field. Lambs, however, were considered clean animals. And so what God says is this. He said, every firstborn male has to be committed to me first, but I will not receive an unclean animal as the sacrifice. And so if you want to keep your firstborn donkey, which you need because you have to put the donkey in the field to work, then you're going to redeem that donkey by sacrificing a clean lamb. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, in our modern day vernacular, this doesn't make sense. Here's what you have to understand. God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. I'm not meant to completely understand this logically, but in my spirit, I know that if God said it, he had a purpose for it. And why would God say that the firstborn is committed to him? Why would God set up this principle of the first? It's because if you really want to trust God, you have to learn to give to him first. If you really want to trust God, give from your first. But the reality of what the Old Testament is telling us is so much more important because this is actually a foreshadowing of Jesus. I'm going to say it like I feel it in my heart, so let me just be honest with you. Jesus is titled the Lamb of God. He was God's firstborn son, and he was sacrificed so a bunch of donkeys like us could be redeemed. I almost said jackass, but I didn't say it. <laughs> because this is the truth. Jesus was sacrificed so we could be redeemed. He was the chosen lamb of God, the first and only pure spotless lamb of God, the clean human being, the clean purpose of God. And yet we, with our dirty selves, we were still redeemed because God chose to sacrifice him. What God was doing in the Old Testament is he was setting up a principle that the first can either be redeemed or sacrificed. Jesus was sacrificed so our first could be redeemed. The rest of our lives are redeemed because of what Jesus did on the cross. And that's the good news. The other good news is this. Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. And in fact, what Jesus actually did is he elevated the law. This principle uh, that we don't have to listen to the Old Testament, that's foolishness. Jesus said, the, the law of Moses said that you could divorce your wife or the law of Moses says, uh, uh, don't commit adultery. Here's what Jesus said. He said, don't even look lustfully at a woman. He said, because if you see somebody and you look lustfully, you've already committed adultery. So Jesus didn't come to just abolish everything. He came to take it not from the actions, but from the heart. And this is what God is trying to implement with the people in the Old Testament. These laws were all about the heart of people, not just the actions of people. He wanted them to see, you need to put me first. And so this principle of the first also attaches to something we call the tithe. And we touched on this last week a little bit. But I want to share with you a little bit more about what the Bible says because the tithe is a multifaceted type of thing. This principle is important because we, when the Old Testament, uh, the tithe was 10% of all the increase of the people's harvest. And we're talking about an agricultural. Uh, how many of you have ever heard the argument, we don't tithe because we're not farmers? You ever heard that before? I had a guy one time who told me that. He said the tithe was all about plants. 
It was all about harvest. It's not about money. And here's what that shows me. It shows me that when he read about tithing in the Bible, he was more concerned with the action more than he was the heart behind it. What I want to share with you today is the principle that the best comes from the first, and the best comes when you put God first. God translated this principle into what we call the tithe. And the tithe in the Old Testament had this other name. It was a pronoun. I'll say it that way. It was called the first fruits. Somebody say first fruits. The first fruits, here's the second thing you need to remember. The first fruits are all about honoring God. The first fruits are all about honoring God. I mentioned 2 Chronicles chapter 31 last week. Uh, this is about a king named Hezekiah. Uh, Hezekiah is in the midst of war and famine, and he told the people of God, he said, we are going to tithe our way out of this problem. And look at what it says in verse uh, 5 of 2 Chronicles 31. It says, as soon as the order went out, the Israelites generously gave the first fruits of their grain, their new wine, their olive oil and honey, and all that the fields produced. They brought a great amount, a tithe of everything. So here's that pronoun, a tithe of everything. It was their first fruits. What's happening here is Hezekiah, the king, the leader of the people said, we have gotten away from bringing God the first fruits of our increase. And that is why we are living in the calamity we have today. He said, we need to put God first. And the best way to put God first is to tithe with the first fruits. You might say, Stephen, why does this even matter? I'll tell you why it matters. Because if I walked up to you today and I took all the money that you have out of your bank account, you would hate me. If I asked you what is your most cherished possession other than your children, or your spouse, hopefully. By the way, the answer is always children or spouse first. But your material possession, and I snatched that away from you, you'd hate me, wouldn't you? Why? Because I took it something that was not mine. You cherish that thing. When you learn to put God first through the tithe, what you are doing is you are saying, God, <laughs> I trust you. I honor you first before anything else. And here's what God promises in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 and 10. This is wisdom right here. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. And here's what his promise is. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. This is a multifaceted principle because last week we talked about the tithe being generational investment. It's a generational investment into the house of God to feed, to make sure that the things of God are taken care of, that there's food in God's house. But the tithe that, uh, uh, to support the mission to introduce real people to the real Jesus, but the tithe goes further than that because the tithe first and foremost is about putting God first. It's about putting God first. Let me say it again. It's about putting God first. It's about this is God first. In Exodus 23, verse 19, it says, bring the best of the first fruits of your soil to the house of the Lord, your God. The tithe is the best of our increase and it's brought to God's house. In the Old Testament, this would have been the temple. In the New Testament, in us now, this is called the local church. I hope you understand this. I don't wanna make this weird or anything, but the word temple still applies today. The, the church, we call it the church, but the building itself is actually still the temple. And I know we don't call it that anymore, but when you bring the tithe, you bring the tithe into your local church. So I tell people all the time, if you're here as a guest and this is not your church, please don't bring your tithe here. Take it back to your local church. If you're a guest here, you're not committed to tithe here because this is not the local church you've committed yourself to yet. If it is, I encourage you to start tithing. But in Exodus 23, it says, bring the best. In Malachi 3.10, it mimics this verbiage as well. It says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Here's a principle you need to understand. You cannot give the tithe. You can only bring the tithe. Because the Bible says that the tithe belongs to God. The tithe is not ours. The tithe is God's. And when you say, I'm going to give the tithe, what you're saying is, I own this first and now I'm giving it to God first. But in reality, God says this, it was mine to begin with, and all you're doing is bringing it back to me. This, this is what the Bible, before you get upset with me, 
before you theological scholars try to argue with me after the service, this is the Bible. Now, just, just so we can be level with each other, okay? I'm a human being just like you. I like my money. I want to keep my money, all my money. I want to pay my bills. I want to buy nice things. I'm a diva. I love nice things. <laughs> I was talking to somebody yesterday. They were talking about how uh, their dad loves nice things, and uh, they said it's because of how he grew up. When you grow up poor and you finally get your own money, you want nice things. It's just how, I don't know, I just something. I don't know, it's selfishness, whatever you want to call it. But I like my money. But you know what I learned when I started studying the scripture? I learned that without Jesus, I wouldn't have had any of this to begin with. And so I had to commit to myself that I am going to bring God what is his, the 10% of my increase. So I bring the 10%, and here's what the Bible promises in Malachi 3. If I bring God the 10%, then the 90% that's mine is blessed. It's blessed. So let's practice this. Let me show you. We did this last week. I want to just practice it again. Let's say somebody comes up to me and says, Stephen, here's $1,000, which, by the way, you are more than welcome to do that today. <laughs> here's $1,000. Also, because I know my church and we're in central Arlington, this is fake money, so don't come at me after service, okay? It won't do you any good. I learned my lesson a long time ago. No, this is fake money. But let's say somebody comes up and says, Stephen, here's $1,000. And here's what they say. This is for you. This is for you. I have a choice. I can take one of these $100 and bring God the tithe and trust his word and trust that this will be blessed if I bring God the 10%. Or I can say, well, that guy did say, this is for you. <laughs> and I can keep it all together. What I've learned in my short amount of years that I've been on this planet is that when I put God first, he blesses this more and does more with the 90 than I could do with 100. So if somebody comes and gives me 1,000, here's a trick question though. How do I know which one of these $100 bills is the tithe? When I get paid, how do I know what part of that paycheck is the tithe? It's the first. It, it's, it's the first. Again, I want you to go back. This is not a principle about the action. This is a principle about the heart. Tithing is about the heart. So when I, somebody comes up to me in the name of Jesus after the service and gives me $1,000, here's what I do. I immediately take $100, put it in an offering envelope, put it in the giving drop box, and I say, God, this is yours, not mine. Thank you for this blessing. It's a reminder. The tithe is a reminder of God's best. The tithe is a reminder of God's best. My wife and I, when we get paid, we set up a recurring tithe. So online, you can go to give.revivechurch.com. It's just automatically recurring. Every month, we know what we're going to make from our paychecks. So we have a tithe set up. It automatically goes out. But from time to time, I have a business that makes money. Uh, I have uh, other jobs that I do on the side. And so I get paid. And you know what the first thing I do when that money hits my account? The first thing I do is I get online and I tithe. The first thing I do is I get online and I tell God, thank you so much. Thank you for supplying for my family because I remember in 2008, I remember when I was going through foreclosure and I remember when my vehicle was about to get repoed and I remember I didn't have a job for six months and I remember I was fighting and clawing and trying to find money for groceries and I remember you took care of me even then and I thank you God that since 2008, I've never had to walk in poverty again and I thank you Lord that that because you are first, the rest is blessed. Because you are first, the best comes from you. And I didn't do it on my own, but you gave me wisdom. And you opened doors that no man could shut. And you shut doors that no man could open. And you poured out your favor. And you poured out your blessing. And you made sure every bill was paid. And every need was met. And when diapers were running low, somebody would show up on my front door and supply it. And when groceries were running low, somebody 
somebody showed up on the front door and supplied it. God, you made a way when there is no way. So for every thousand, you can have a hundred. And because you're so good, you can have 200. And you're so good, you can have 300. God, you can have it all if that's what you say to do. Why? Because you are first in my life. I am reminded of how good you are. Man, he's so, so good. So from the abundance of my heart, from knowing that God is good, from knowing that he comes first, that tithe is just a reminder of God's best. Leviticus 27.30, a tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. And here's the word he says. He says, it is holy to the Lord. That word, listen, when you see the word holy in the Lord, you need to pause and meditate on that. Anything that God says is holy is sacred. It's important. It's holy to the Lord. What that means is it's literally set apart. The tithe had a purpose, and we talked about that last week. You can go listen to that message, uh, being a generational investor. But the tithe is holy to God. One of, the, uh, one of those arguments, again, is that you know, the tithe is all about agriculture. It's all about grain and wine, as the Bible says in the Old Testament. That's not true. The truth is the tithe is about the increase that God provides in your life and putting him first. I, I told you this example last week uh, about being a generational investor. When I tithe, I'm not a, gen a generic giver. I'm a generational investor because I am meeting the needs of God's house so the mission can be fulfilled. You know what I'm grateful for? I'm grateful when I was a student, there were people tithing that I didn't know about so that I could have a youth ministry. I didn't appreciate it then. I had to sit through service like some of these teenagers, and they're like, is he ever going to show up? Shut up, man. He talks too long. I know. I noticed, like, I was a student too, but I'm grateful as an adult now that I got fed the word of God because people were tithing so that church could succeed. I'm grateful today that there were people tithing so that I could have the word of God preached to me every single week, so I could have an environment where I could grow spiritually. I'm grateful that people tithe so I could go on missions trips. I'm grateful that people tithe so I could go to summer camps and experience the power of the Holy Ghost. I'm grateful for those things. But if those people had not, guess what? The church would not have food in its house to fulfill. I'm grateful that you tithe. Because when you tithe to the house, you also tithe through the house. Because we as a church, we believe this so strongly that we have a church tithe. And when you give into this ministry, whether through the tithes or offerings, we set aside a minimum of 10%, a minimum as our own church tithe. And that money goes out into what we call love your neighbor. That goes back out to meet the needs of people, to make sure that in times of crisis, organizations have what they need. We've been able to give away thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. Over and I believe one day we'll be able to give millions and millions and millions of dollars through your hands. But I said it's all about being a generational investor. And let me show you this in Exodus 13. Now, hopefully you're still there. Go to verse 14 now. Here's what God instructs his people. So when you sacrifice that firstborn lamb, when you commit the first to God, he said, in days to come, when your son asks you, what does this mean? Daddy, <laughs> I liked my pet donkey. Why'd you have to go and kill him? He said, you say to him, with a mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. When Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed the firstborn of both people and animals in Egypt. This is why I sacrifice to the Lord the first male offspring of every womb and redeem each of my firstborn sons. He said, one day... Somebody's going to ask you from this generation, why do you tithe? Why do you put God first? Why do you go to church? Why do you commit the first day of every week to church, to being in the presence of God? Why do you do these things? And that is your opportunity to say, because I had hell on earth before Jesus, because I messed up in my life. And God redeemed me through his son. And so he is first in everything that I do now. And you get to share with them a generational message of Jesus. Last week, I told you about this story. I was hired to do some work during the crisis of 2008. <clears throat> I was losing my home. I got fired from the church I was working at. Don't ask me why. And uh, everybody always wants to know why. 
just, it was dumb. I didn't do anything sinful, let me just say that. I was just, I was a dumb kid, that's all. And uh, I remember this guy in the church, he knew my situation, and uh, he said, I want to hire you. He was flipping houses before flipping houses was cool, and so he was flipping houses in Oak Cliff and Deep Ellum in the, uh, the Dallas area. He asked me to come help him. He said, I'll pay you $12 an hour. And he had no business asking me to help him with anything uh, because <laughs> I'm not handy. I can pray over you. I will pray that your plumbing gets fixed, that you have a miracle, but I will not touch the wrench because I will break it more. But he offered this, and I needed the money. He said, I'll pay you $12. We spent 10 hours in that house building these cabinets from Ikea, which, by the way, is the worst as well. But anyway, at the end of the day, we're driving home, and he, he hands me $150, and he said, I just want to bless you above and beyond what I promised you. And so we're driving down, and I remember my first thought is, oh, thank God I can buy groceries. And it's like he knew what I was thinking. And this man who was married now, had a successful, several successful businesses, he said, hey, don't forget to tithe. I almost cussed him out. I was like, excuse me? I want to say, you know what I've been through? But here's what he did. He said, hey, don't forget to tithe. And here's what he said. Because I remember what it was like to have nothing. I remember when I first learned to put God first in my finances, and my pastor was teaching on tithing. And he began to share with me his history of putting God first in the tithe. And here's what he was doing. He was establishing for me that Malachi 3, verse 10, is true. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. This is what God says. First, first bring the tithe into the house so that the church can have food to meet the needs of people, to succeed in the mission, to glorify God. But here's what God says. Test me in this. Literally test God. See if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing, there won't be room enough to store it. I am so grateful that Chris Rupert tithed. Because when he tithed, God began to open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing on him. He had too much so he could take someone who had nothing and give them more than enough. That's the promise of putting God first. The best comes from the first, not from the tithe. The best comes from God. The tithe is just putting God first. So you might say, Stephen, what in the world does this have to do with Christmas? You haven't mentioned presents or Santa Claus one time. Glad you asked. I said this series is all about making this Christmas the best Christmas. We started out saying that God said the firstborn must either be sacrificed or redeemed. So here's my challenge to every single one of you. And I, let me tell you, full transparency. I said, I feel like this is going to show up on social media, and I'm going to be known as the pastor who said to cancel Christmas this year. <laughs> I thought this is going to be so misconstrued. But I have to, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, because if I am your pastor, I have to share this with you. If you want to make this Christmas the best Christmas it might mean that you have to sacrifice some things this Christmas financially. It might mean that you have to start tithing today to experience the blessing for next year. It means you might not go into debt this year for a bunch of presents, but instead you choose to put God first in your finances. Before you go shopping on Black Friday, it might mean you tithe. If this is your local church, you tithe here. If you go back to your local church, you tithe there. It might mean that you have to have an honest conversation with your children. And you might have to tell them, mommy and daddy are going to get you a set, of, set amount of things, these few things, but we want to tell you, we are committing to put God first. And you get to share with them what you're doing financially, that you're bringing God the tithe. And here's what you tell them. But the Bible says that God will pour out blessing on us. And we're believing that we won't just be generous with you next Christmas. We're believing we'll be able to be generous with multiple families next Christmas. You might have to have a crucial conversation with your bank account. 
you might have to have a crucial conversation with your MasterCard, with your American Express. And you might have to tell them, I've been worshiping you for too long. You are no longer first in my life. So you don't get paid first. I bring God the tithe first. Then if I have something for you, Amex, you'll get it. If I don't, come at me, bro. It's fine. You might have to call your student loan uh, provider and have an honest conversation. And you just say, listen to me. I want you to know what Malachi 3.10 says. The Bible says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. I've been rebuking God by not bringing him the tithe. I've been giving you my tithe. And that's why you're blessed and I'm cursed. I ain't doing it no more. You take it up with God. I know that sounds ridiculous and hilarious. But the truth of the matter is, I had that conversation with Visa, MasterCard, Discover, and my God, Amex. Had it with every one of my student loan providers. Ally was at the top. Told them, I cannot pay you. Why? Because I chose to put God first. You would not believe the awkward silence on the other end of the line. <laughs> Who are you and what are you talking about? They didn't understand, but baby, they don't get one dime from me anymore because my God provided more than I could have ever needed. He wiped out that debt supernaturally. I got story after story, and I don't have time to share it, but today I stand in abundant blessing because I chose to put God first in my darkest moment. In my moment of poverty, in my moment where I had the least, I put God first, and he took me from the least to the most. Yesterday, I got to take my daughters to the store to shop for Operation Christmas Child. And we rolled up and down them aisles. And you know kids, they want to buy everything. And I had this conversation with them. Before we left, I, I had to have this conversation. I said, we're going to go to the store, and I want you to understand something. This is not about you. That's hard for a kid to hear. What? It's not about me? I said, no, it ain't about you. When we go to the store, I don't want to hear, I want this, I want that. This is not about you. One of them is two, so she didn't quite get it. The other one is six, so she definitely didn't get it. But I said, this is not about you. I said, mommy and daddy are so blessed that before we even bless you on Christmas, you get to bless other kids who don't have anything. So we're going to go to the store, and we're going to start picking out things. My daughters are wild <laughs> at the store. Maybe your kids are better behaved. They just grab, just grab, don't even ask, just grab, daddy, this. But my daughter, her six-year-old, she would grab something, and she'd go, I think my girl would want this. I'd say, put it in the basket. I think my girl would want this. Put it in the basket. <laughs> that two-year-old almost made me cry. She grabbed something, and she said, my girl want this. Throw it in the basket. <laughs> my girl want this. Throw it in the basket. <laughs> but I share that with you because I want you to understand something. I wasn't calculating in my head how much it was going to cost because God has been so good to me. I said, God, whatever they put their hands on is going to be blessed so we're going to buy it. And we just began to put things in the car. And then we got home and tried to stuff it all into that little shoebox. But we did it. Praise the Lord. I don't know. There was a miracle, like a fish and loaves miracle in reverse in that shoebox. But I tell you that because I want you to understand the severity of this. When a pastor asks for the tithe, it's because we want your money. Now, you might think, how dare you say that? It's the truth. Without you tithing... Lights don't get paid. Light bill doesn't get paid. Without you tithing, I don't get a salary. My kids don't eat. That's selfish. It might sound selfish, but it's biblical. So I, I, I appreciate every single person who tithes. But more than that, I appreciate the fact that you tithe because when everybody starts tithing, when the majority of our church says, I'm putting God first, we have over and above what we need, and we can be multiple blessings to other people. But more than that, I want you to tithe because I want you to experience what I've been able to experience. Amen. I want you to experience the blessing of God. It doesn't mean you ain't going to make stupid mistakes. Absolutely. I've done some dumb stuff with my money. Dumb stuff. Cryptocurrency. Dumb stuff. <laughs> 
I've done stupid things with my money. I've still been, I've splurged sometimes when I shouldn't have. Absolutely. But every single season, when I chose to put God first consistently, the blessing continued to increase. I'm by no means Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos. But you know what? I wouldn't want a billion dollars under the curse. I'd rather have what I've got today under God's blessing. So I want to encourage you today. This might be the year. If you want to make this Christmas the best Christmas, some of you might have to sacrifice a little bit this Christmas to put God first financially. So I want to encourage you. Go online. Set up a tithe. Tithe today. Put God first. And here's what God says. Test me in this. And when you test him and you honor him and you put him first, he said, I will bless you. 